Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Dear Mr. Oberauer, dear editor-in-chief, dear editors-in-chief, I would like to thank you very much for this opportunity. And some people in the room will have asked themselves whether uh, in light of the imminent takeover of Monsanto, we have time to do that. Well, some people are sports enthusiasts and they know that uh, Bayern well, had to fight very hard in order to uh, stay in the race. And now at the end of the German Bundesliga, well, uh, I was a bit distracted, I admit, but I'm very pleased to be able to be here today. So what we are talking about here is primarily about opinions and acceptance. So we are talking about something that is not only important for media companies, but also for other businesses. This is highly relevant for us, and this is why, Mr. Obauer, I have gladly followed your invitation, and I want to talk about the changes in our internal communication and uh, communication that affects all of us. So on the one hand, as you mentioned, we are talking about technological change. And these technolog technological changes have an impact all over the world. But there are also developments that we are seeing in Germany as well as all over Europe. As you know, Bayer, owing to the planned takeover of Monsanto, we are under special media scrutiny globally. And we have made a few experiences with the specificities of the European debate that I'm going to share with you today. And I guess there is hardly a more fitting venue than Vienna to talk about this rapid change in the media world. Vienna is a city which, in many respects, stands for the exact opposite, namely for the culture of the cafes, the coffee houses. Stefan Zweig uh, once described <coughs> his stay in the cafes of Vienna with the following words. Every day we spend hours sitting in various cafes and nothing escaped us. And that's exactly the opposite of our situation and the media behavior that we are now observing. In the morning I first read a printed paper, sometimes I just peruse it, then I check uh, the PC, uh, all kinds of newspapers, and uh, I check on especially the articles written about Bayer, our company. And what I'm seeing in our public debate is a contradiction, and this contradiction becomes increasingly exacerbated. There are two spheres that are moving apart from each other increasingly, especially as far as the factor of time is concerned. So on the one hand, is the world of companies. Decisions are being taken on the basis of a long-term analysis. That doesn't mean, however, that no mistakes are being made. Quite on the contrary. The risk of failure always exists. But of course, as a rule, it happens on the basis of decisions that had been analyzed in detail in terms of risks and opportunities that these decisions would present. It's always about the long-term perspective of companies. The first offer that we made for Monsanto was made almost exactly two years ago. The responsibility of entrepreneurs to take risky decisions. Not taking any risks is not an option. And this needs to be a broad societal consensus. Now let me move on to the third side effect, and that's too much opinion and not enough facts. We all noticed how, oh, well, we talked about fake news, about facts, about alternative facts. Alternative facts was the non-word of the year 2017. I think that I'm speaking on behalf of everybody here in the room that this was 
rightly the non-word of the year because uh, this conveyed the impression that there are alternatives to certain facts, but these don't exist, in fact. There are no alternative facts. Every individual is entitled to his or her own opinion, but nobody should have uh, the right to his or her own facts. That's a fundamental difference, and this is one reason why journalism, as I see it, requires a clear separation between opinion and facts. Of course, there can be different perspectives, points of view, and interests. And of course, this shapes our consciousness. That's one side. But on the other side, there are also instances that create facts. And from my perspective, we need to develop a new sense of what is acceptable and what isn't. Now, what are these instances that create facts? For example, an authority that defines a risk on behalf of society. A scientist coming up with an expert opinion or maybe a court of law that uh, passes a final judgment. This is how facts are created and these form the basis for societal and company decisions. They ensure um, calculability instead of arbitrariness. We have to become aware and communicate more clearly when opinions are exchanged and when we are arguing and when facts exist and what these facts are relevant for. Today, we're experiencing how interest groups and lobbies are undermining this factual basis. What is right or wrong is not decided by the authorities or instances, but public opinion characterized by public campaigns that are often driven by minorities, and that is wrong. This takes me to the last side effect of communication not taking enough responsibility. You have to make it clear what you stand for and what position you take. Media have a democratic task. They need to report to the general public. They need to question decisions. And when dealing with Google, Facebook, and others, the historic task of digitization needs to be mastered and overcome. That is a difficult role and hard to fulfill. Companies such as ours have a business model. We represent the interests of our customers, our employees, and our shareholders. <coughs> NGOs basically <coughs> are doing exactly the same. They also have a business model, and they represent the interests of those who support them. Their way of representing their own interest is legitimate and necessary, and I'm not sure whether our economies without the influence of NGOs would have uh, mastered the developments of uh, the past few years uh, the way they did in terms of sustainability. But what I'm criticizing is the business model that some NGOs have agreed on. It is based on a very simple logic. The more dramatic uh, an issue is presented, the more likely it is uh, to be supported financially. We're experiencing a competition for, well, people's share of mind. There's, uh, well, words such as poison and f fears are conjured up. And as long as the campaign is running, donations will be flowing in. And our business model is a different one. We create and invent new and better products that meet people's needs. We strive to be innovative and societal progress. We take responsibility for societies and for more than 100,000 jobs. Ladies and gentlemen, those are the side effects of communication that we need to deal with. I would like to describe how we are doing this. All right, we take opportunities to voice our views. <coughs> We explain, we explain, and we explain all the time. That is our motto. Over and above that, it's important to distinguish between uh, justified concerns and um, fear-mongering. Now, real concerns, real questions, 
and concerns. That's something that we uh, devote a lot of attention to. What we try to seek is dialogue involving critical stakeholders. We use all the technical channels available, and we have people working for us that you can actually talk to. What is our underlying principle? We want to talk with each other rather than talk about each other. As far as fear-mongering is concerned, the situation is quite different. That's where we are going to voice our views. We are convinced that our views are justified, and we're also convinced that we make important contributions to society. Now, this is true for BIA, but this should also hold true for the corporate world and the world of science. We um, have long-term strategies in mind, and that's why we need to always stress long-term development. Often, what we feel is that things are becoming worse and worse. There are more and more accidents, disasters, scandals that erupt, and that's what the public focuses on. That's the image that is generated. But the contrary is true. Just um, think beyond the rim of the teacup and look beyond the rim of the teacup. Just look at the progress that's been made over the past 20 years. Over the past 20 years, abject poverty has been uh, eliminated more quickly than during any other phase of human history. Child mortality has dropped since 1990, over the past 30 years, by more than 50%. Now, what about quality of life? What was quality of life like in the mid-19th century when this wonderful building was erected, as well as the Burgtheater next door? Well, at the time, life expectancy hovered between 35 and 40 years. So let's not delude ourselves. Today's world, of course, is healthier than it's ever been, and it's safer than it's ever been. Which, of course, also means, and which does not, well, which does not mean that we don't have any challenges to overcome. But let's just focus on this in this era of negative news. So there is a paradoxical situation. Through modern technologies, there's freedom of press, of the press. And that's why we learn more about events unfolding at a global level. So um, coverage, of course, has also improved. Media coverage has improved. But uh, consumers often feel that the contrary is true. We should try to counter this together, ladies and gentlemen. Because good news, ladies and gentlemen, is news as well. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you very much for having listened to me so attentively. Thanks for also having been able to make a few critical comments. It's important, of course, for media to remain critical. I very much appreciate the work that you are all carrying out. I'd like to encourage you to um, also voice critical views when it comes to countering the zeitgeist prevailing in your industry. You should call things into question. You should shed light on developments. You should rely on quality rather than click rates. You should develop and strengthen your own opinions, empower your own opinions, rather than just voicing the views touted by others. And with this, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention.